Welcome again this evening. Uh, we are again streaming from home tonight. I trust in that uh, we can be of a blessing and encouragement. Glad you could be with us tonight. This is uh, Dr. Lance Ketchum from Shepherd's Full Baptist Church in Hutchinson, Minnesota. And uh, we, of course, this morning looked at uh, the, the book of Revelations and uh, looked at uh, the central purpose of the book of Revelation, seeing that its intent is to show us to glorify Jesus Christ, to see and to uh, show us what we will be like when we are glorified, and to see our destiny, our destiny, of course, which is in heaven, and uh, to a new existence, one that we do not uh, have presently at right, right now. Uh, one thing we ought to realize is that faith in God is is more than just an ideology. Unfortunately, I believe much of Christianity today has been converted to an ideology called Christianity, not to something that's real. Faith in its essence, essence is, is a vision that sees another existence that is completely different than the existence in which we live. The fact is that we live in a world to which we no longer belong. We're not citizens here. The Bible says we're just sojourners. We're just passing through. We're on our way to a new destiny. That's a sure thing for us uh, who are born again of the Spirit of God. And it ought to be something that uh, we ought to change the way we live. That's really the meaning of the word faith. Faith is more than just mere believing and an intellectual assent to facts. Um, Biblically, faith is a commitment. It is an involvement. It transposes us from uh, a temporal reality into another reality that we presently can't see, but it's still just as real as we can imagine. And so that's what we want to look at tonight. We're going to go back to the book of Revelation, and we're going to look uh, this evening at the three blessings of God uh, that are promised to the believer in the book of Revelation. And um, these are very important for us. We see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us that Jesus revealed certain things to the Apostle John. John saw and recorded with words what he saw with the intent that it would be showed to all the servants of Jesus Christ. So God gave it to John to give it to us so that we could give it to others. That's a concept of the servants of Jesus Christ. When Christ left this world, he sent his spirit into this world to indwell believers to make us all little Christ. So what Christ began to do, we continue to do today uh, through the indwelling of the Spirit of God. So the revelation that was given to John, we are to make sure that others are familiar with it and to teach them. So therefore, one of the first things we learn about the book of Revelation is that it's intended for believers. It is not really intended for unbelievers, even though the revelations recorded therein provide extensive warnings for unbelievers. Unbelievers are unbelievers because they refuse to accept the scriptures as God's inspired words. So the Bible, after all, is a faith book. <laughs> and it's for people who are believers. If you don't believe the Bible, you, don't, you can't accept the Bible as a book from God, that it's inspired of God and that every word is trustworthy. It reveals to us uh, things about God and truths about uh, another existence. In other words, we would not know. You know, Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the Bible, after all, is a faith book. And so it's written for believers, people who will, uh, who believe that there is a God and want to find out about him and know about him. So God has communicated to us in these 66 books uh, we know as the scriptures. In Revelation 1, in verses 1 through 3, we've read this text, but we'll read it again tonight. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things 
which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of the things that he saw. So he bear record of the word of God. And that's important for us to see. He testified that this was the word of God. It's not just a, a fable. It's not just a fantasy. It's not just some kind of dream maker thing. It's a record from God to give us details that he wants us to know about the other side. The new, new Genesis, that's ours, eternity. And then in verse 3, he said, Blessed is he that readeth, first blessing, and they that hear the words of his prophecy, second blessing, and then, and keep those things which are written there in third blessing, for the time is at hand. So, uh, it's very, very close for all of this to take place. Remember, one day as with the Lord is a thousand years. And again, we, we want to say that that's simply a comparison as far as God doesn't operate by the same timetable we operate by. Um, the intent of the comparison is, is that it's been 2,000 years since the second since Christ ascended, but in God's timetable it's just a small fraction of time, infinitesimal amount of time compared to all of that. So in Revelation 1.1 1, 1, it also tells us that once the things beginning uh, in chapter 4 begin to happen, they will happen very rapidly. And of course, within seven years, there is an escalation. The first three and a half years, we have the first six seal judgments. And then probably in the short time of the next three and a half years, we have the uh, seven uh, trumpet, or the six trumpet judgments. The seventh being in probably the last few days, weeks, maybe uh, months of the seven year tribulation. We have the seven bowl judgments. They're going to unfold very quickly, very rapidly. And I believe we're standing upon the brink of that time right now. We have the events of, of uh, all of the world events that are happening right now are, are being fulfilled before our eyes, preparing for, before the day of the rise of the Antichrist and the catching away of the church. The church will be caught away first and then the Antichrist will be revealed. The first three chapters... Uh, of Revelation have taken almost 2,000 years so far. But from Revelation 4.1 through Revelation 19.21 it's going to be a roller coaster ride to Armageddon. Very quick. And all the judgments of the tribulation will take place in a short seven year period. They no more will think that they've, they've seen this great uh, cataclysmic uh, judgment of God and the next one will come even greater than the one before. So we are presently in the countdown to the rapture right now. We're at, right at the end of the church age and uh, we are coming upon that. And only God knows the timetable when the revelation uh, when revelation chapter will begin. This, this All of that happens. When, when it all begins, chapter 4 really begins to happen. So uh, in, in Mark 13, here we find in verse 28, Christ uh, begins to explain the parable of the fig tree. He says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Here, here's what it's about. And this parable is about the end times. He says, when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Otherwise, you know you're in spring because now uh, the branch is starting to bear forth leaves. So you know you're in the springtime. And the summer is coming very quickly right after that. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that is nigh even at the door. So we know the seasons. Nothing needs to happen uh, before... Uh, of course, uh, beginning of the of the rapture, it can be caught away at any time. But we can see the seasons. We can know that things are being prepared for this. 
Some of these events are the rise, of course, of a one-world government. And only two other times in the world has this ever come close, and both times God stepped in. One in the, in the time of the flood, God put an end to it. God promised just by the rainbow that he'd never flood the earth again. And then at the time of uh, Babel and the confounding of the languages, now we are coming to the third time of that, and the rise of a one world government and under the Antichrist. And Christ will uh, step in, take his bride out of here, and then will begin to uh, release his uh, restraint upon evil in the world, and the judgments uh, will come. In verse 30 uh, of Mark 13, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you that this generation, that, that's a generation living at the time of the rapture of the church, shall not pass till all these things be done. Now, generation's about 20 years, uh, but the generation that begins the tribulation, all those that, that are at that age, the, that generation won't go away until all of these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God's promises are sure. What, what Christ says he's going to do, he's going to do. Now here's an important verse. Because we have a lot of people today predicting uh, that what day uh, the rapture is going to take place, what day Jesus is coming again. A lot of people are be, being deceived by that. But in uh, here in Mark 13, verse 32, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man. Know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son of Man, but the Father. Father is the only one that knows. It's his choice. So he says, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time has come. So we're supposed to be constantly ready uh, and watching and praying. Otherwise, be prayed up. Uh, be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus. For we know not what the time is. Now, we have a lot of those today who say, well, why doesn't the Son of God know the timetable? That's the usual question uh, on focus on this text. Well, the real Im import of the text is we should focus on two principles that he intends to teach by this statement. And they're very important principles. First, anyone pr speculating about a specific date is wasting the time allotted to them because no one knows. Anyone that anyone says uh, that says they know is wrong. So if someone says they know, mark that person as a false teacher and a charlatan right away, and to stop listening to that fool because he doesn't deserve your attention. Uh, God says no one knows but the Father, and so uh, no man knows. The second principle is because the rapture is imminent, otherwise at any moment, every Christian should be strongly motivated to ceaseless action in service, ministry, and spiritual growth. We need to be sober because we don't know how much time we have. Now, Why should this be true of every believer priest of the church age? Because in the twinkling of an eye, your opportunity of service may be ended, and all those things you've been planning to do for the Lord will never get done. And simply because you've got good intentions doesn't mean that those intentions are ever going to be done. Uh, you, you say, well, tomorrow I'll do this or that. Well, you don't know if you've got tomorrow. You only have today. And so there's an urgency in everything that we do. So according to Revelation 1.1, Jesus sent an angel to John to signify all of this for us. So this word signify means to make known. Uh, Jesus sent this angel to make these things known so we would know them. And in this case, this will be done by the means of signs, which in this case means visions to John. John would see these visions. And then John would be transported through time to see the actual happenings and events of the tribulation, the ends of the earth, uh, the creation of the new heaven and the new earth as we know it. Uh, God's going to end this earth as we know it and create a new one. So then it becomes every believer's responsibility 
to make it, make sure everyone else knows about these things. Only believers take these things seriously. And so believers will be will say, well, this is going to happen. It's my responsibility to make it known. Uh, you, you know, uh, it's irresponsible not to make it known. John saw and gave accurate witness to what he saw by divine revelation in, in Revelation 1-2. So he saw and witnessed to it. However, we should remember that Jesus Christ is the author of Revelation, not the Apostle John. John simply recorded, he bare record or wrote down what was revealed to him. And the same things that John wrote down, you have. So you have prophecy and when you teach what what John received, you teach prophecy. You teach what's going to happen. So in other words, he wrote down what God the Father said, what Jesus Christ said, what the angels said, and gave record of the visions of the future that were shown to him. He saw something about the future that now he has told us. He recorded what he heard, the word of God. Uh, he recorded the testimony of Jesus Christ, what Jesus said, and all the things that he saw in these visions. He recorded them all. Well, you have them too, because you're reading and you're believing what God's Word says. So as we read, hear, and keep these words, let us be constantly reminded that we enter into the amphitheater of God where we will be able to see the future as John saw it through his eyes and through his description. We're right there. Uh, if you believe the Bible is the Word of God, then you have to believe these things are going to happen. It's just as real to you as if you saw them yourself. That's what faith does. Faith sees this. Faith is a vision that sees the invisible as reality. Now, as we read Revelation 1-3, we see the first promise of the book of Revelation, and it's threefold. The word he is singular here. So any individual that personally reads the book of Revelation is blessed of God. Now, the idea here is that this person enters the realm of God's blessing by reading the book of Revelation. You're, you're entering into this realm of God's blessing, the place of blessedness. Uh, it's like what Christ says in Matthew chapter 5, blessed is he. Otherwise, when you live according to those beatitudes, you enter into the realm of God's blessedness. So is it true here with the vision of the book of Revelation. When you read and see these things through the eyes of faith, you are literally entering into the realm of God's blessedness through the eyes of faith. So the word read means to distinguish between or to know accurately. Uh, it's not just to mean to read the words. The blessing to the individual is not upon the mechanical reading of the book, but upon the in-depth study of the book with the intent of thoroughly knowing its contents. Uh, so the, the idea of reading here is reading with understanding, with comprehension, to grasp these truths, to live in, with, within the, the reality of what they say, to see the events that are on up, upon our horizon as just as real as you're standing there looking upon them and seeing, uh, seeing tomorrow uh, and acting upon that in a, in a real sense. Now 2 Timothy 2.15 gives us a similar commandment about this blessing of reading. Here the Apostle Paul tells Timothy in the pastoral epistle, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Now this word study is an interesting word because the, the idea here is that you are to be a student of the Word of God. Uh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Obviously, if you can rightly divide it, you can wrongly divide it. This is what is known as the doctrine of hermeneutics, this, the science of exacting the meaning out of a text. Now everyone here that's probably listening uh, tonight has, has some idea of hermeneutics. If you studied English 
Uh, you understand the difference between a noun and a verb, an adverb, an adjective, a uh, participle. You understand all of these different forms of language and they all have structure within the syntax or how a sentence and a paragraph is put together. And so you understand language by understanding the syntax of a language, how everything goes together. This is true also of studying the Bible. This is foundational. You have to understand the language in which it's written. And you have to thereby understand its meaning. That's what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. It's exacting the meaning out of the words that are communicated. And it is, it's an exacting science. Now, there's whole books written on this. But here Paul tells Timothy, a pastor, a veteran in the ministry, to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So obviously, even though he has been around for quite a while, quite a while Timothy had been, Paul still reminds him about being a student of the word of God. And then he says, but shun profane, empty, uh, profane means you know, things that have no value, uh, earthly, carnal, and vain, empty babblings, for they will in, un, increase unto more ungodliness. Don't get yourself all preoccupied with the philosophies of the world and, and reading every theologian that comes along, uh, uh, you know, uh, simply because they pur purport to have some kind of intellectual uh, intent. Uh, study the Word of God. So 2 Timothy 2, 15 and 16 is both a command and a warning. The command is to become a student of the Word of God in order to avoid shame. It's a shameful thing when you have the Bible, you have a book, but you don't even understand the words of it, and you read meaning into words that aren't there. That's a shameful thing, and you'll, be, you'll suffer shame at the judgment seat of Christ for such foolishness. But you're to be a student of the Word of God. You're to learn how to understand what it says. So the warning is about totally avoiding foolish questions about which the Bible doesn't speak clearly or about which your understanding is not clear. So don't talk about things you don't know. Learn what you know and talk about the things you do know. Uh, don't be making a bunch of speculations and if you're going to speculate make sure you tell people you're speculating that's your opinion but your opinion isn't the word of God James said essentially the same thing in James chapter 3 and verse 1 he said my brethren be not many masters now this is a caution it's a caution about presenting oneself as an expert Bible teacher or an instructor this was a word that was used for the, the doctors of Israel, uh, like Nicodemus, the master teacher. Uh, it, Paul says, be not many masters. Not everybody is uh, uh, ready to be a teacher. Now, everybody should be preparing themselves to be a teacher. But that the, God has given gifted men to the church, Ephesians 4.12, to perfect, to equip, to mature the saints for the work of the ministry. And uh, that means there's someone that God's given you to instruct you. Uh, but he says, be not many masters. Uh, if, if you don't do that without careful consideration, because with this great position comes great responsibility, great accountability to Christ for accuracy. Just to study out and exact what a portion of Scripture can say just a, a few verses of scripture can take take a day's work if you if you really study it out. Uh, so he says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that ye shall receive the greater condemnation. The idea here is accountability. There's a greater accountability if you're going to be a treat teacher, a, a Bible instructor. Uh, you're going to have greater accountability at the judgment seat of Christ. So, oh, this is a, that's a grave thing. So what uh, James is saying is simple. Do not teach what you do not know. Know what you teach and teach what you know. So I, I had a young man tell me one time he was 
uh, uh, afraid of preaching to a bunch of preachers. And I said, well, why are you afraid? He says, well, I'm afraid I'll say something that's not right. And I said, well, just, just teach them what you know. Don't teach them what you don't know. <laughs> and uh, you'll be okay. So the difficulty is when we start speculating about some things, and uh, no one should be teaching something that they're not confident of what they're saying. The blessing of uh, the book of Revelation is upon those who work to know what it teaches. That's what it means, read it. Work to know what it teaches. Knowing what it teaches will only come by diligent study, exacting understanding. So learning how to study and interpret the Bible is an important part of being a teacher of it. We have a lot of people today who want to be teachers, but they don't want to invest uh, the efforts in learning how to interpret the Bible. Some Bible colleges, they don't even teach hermeneutics and tell you they've already taught you what to believe. That's an unfortunate thing. To some degree, we are all required to teach as believers. Everyone is to make disciples. Being a parent requires that you're going to be teaching your children. A Sunday school teacher is a teacher. Doing the work of evangelism, uh, you are teaching people how to get saved. Uh, and just contending for the faith all require knowing the word of God. But knowing requires study. And not just believing what someone tells you uh, is right, but finding it out and discovering it from the Word of God. That's why I think it's important for pastors not just to teach what they have found out, but where they found it and how they got it. Uh, because in the process, you teach those you are teaching how to do the same thing. So, now we come to the second blessing of the book of Revelation. And it is pronounced upon they, plural, who hear. Now, I believe this is a congregational blessing and implies a blessing on those who will become involved in a group instruction of the book of Revelation. Remember, the church is patterned after the synagogue, not the temple. And the, the synagogue was a place for instruction. And of course they had those who were the teachers in the synagogue and, and uh, those uh, people were allowed to stand and, and give a testimony to the Word of God or read a portion of Scripture and tell what they believed they thought it said. Or, or, but there was already some, somebody there. Always a, a lead uh, instructor said, well, that's right, or no, that's not right. There was a thus saith the Lord kind of guy there. So there is a group instruction of the book of Revelation, and so there is a blessing upon they who hear. Now hear, like read, does not refer to mechanically listening to the words of the book. It refers to giving careful attention. It means to participate in learning by carefully hearing the instruction, taking notes, uh, learning and, and, and learning because you're going to have to teach others the same things. So you want to know in a very clear way what the book of Revelation says. I've always said that what you know deeply, you can teach simply. And so that is the intent of hearing the word of God. Again, again, James gives a similar statement in James 1.22. Uh, it is actually a definitive definition of living faith as opposed to a mere intellectual professing. James says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now we have kind of a, a new world idea of the word faith. That it merely just means believe. But that is not the Old Testament meaning of the word believe or amen. It means to believe to the extent that you act upon what you believe and do what the Bible says. So if God says something, now you live in a new reality. That's what the word believe means. So that's what James is talking about here. He's bringing that Old, Tef Old Testament definition of believing. Uh, into the New Testament by these words, but be doers 
of the word. If you really believe it, be, if you're real faith, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if you're just hearers only, you're deceiving yourself that you have faith. Because that's not faith. So hearers only, uh, from a Greek word meaning an auditor. Uh, Acrotitus. It's a, it just means an auditor. Uh, you, you can go to Bible college or you can go to college somewhere. You can sit in on a class free. No charge. But there's not going to be any examination of you. No testing to find out if you learned anything or you're taking anything with you. You may not have to read the material. You're just there. You're just auditing the class. That's hearers only. It refers to a person who's not accountable for a grade and they're therefore not accountable for learning and accurately living what is taught. So that, that's what James is saying. The central idea of hearers only is one of accountability. Again, the implication is to be an active learner, an active student, through the means of oral instruction, translating what is being taught into the language of living. That's what a, a doers of the word are. Not hearers only. If you're just a hearer, then you, you haven't learned anything, really. You, it doesn't change your life. You haven't learned it, and you haven't believed it. Then we come to the third blessing here of this text, and it's an important one. The third blessing is for those who will keep what they read or hear. Now, the word keep here, to rail, it means to observe and guard. So the implication is to be responsible. The Word of God comes with responsibilities. And the responsibility is to keep it, to preserve it. Uh, you don't take your Bible and preserve it by putting it in the closet someplace so it doesn't ever get uh, dirty or rotten or uh, gets any contact. You, you preserve your Bible by learning it, wearing it out, and living it every day. You bring it into the realm of preservation. So to know brings with it the responsibility to observe what is known by living out the truth known. That's the same thing that James is saying in chapter 1, verse 22. To know and not to do reveals a person determined to oppose them, themselves in spiritual growth and the blessings of God. It's a contradiction. To say you know that this is from God and to say that you believe it's from God and not to do it is a blatant misrepresentation of being a believer because it's a contradiction. In fact, it is a grave manifestation of unbelief in, in, every, in, in, in every way. So we can go over to 2 Timothy here. The Apostle Paul warns about such a person, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26, and and how the faithful believer is to communicate truth to such a person. Now that's, that's the people we've got to take the book of Revelation and teach it to. Believers who believe it and live within that reality, it's real to you. You've got to take that and communicate it to people who don't believe it. And, and they think you're, you're foolish. Uh, they don't even believe in God. But yet, we have to go to those people and persuade them that what God says is going to happen is going to happen. So some people have a bad attitude about people who are really trying to help them. In fact, most people do. Like I say, we, we are uh, in, living in a world to which we no longer belong. Uh, in most cases, this world hates us. They don't, don't want to hear what we have to say. They, they think what we are talking about is just absolute foolishness. Uh, they think we live in fairyland somewhere. And that uh, all the things we talk about is just uh, a bunch of made-up mythological uh, stuff, uh, no different than worshiping a stone idol. But the, the point is, it's our job to convince them, persuade them, that what God says is going to happen is real. So such people require careful, humble, meek appeals to believe the Bible is God's word and begin to live according to God's will. We're to persuade them that. And if you're living contra con contrary to what you say you believe, don't expect anybody to take you seriously. 
I remember a man who was in the Navy and he got saved out of a, a you know a pretty wicked life and uh, but he had spent a lot of time smoking marijuana with most of the other guys on the ship and after he got saved he still was smoking marijuana with him but as he smoked marijuana with him he was uh, trying to witness to him and tell him how to get saved well behind his back they all just mocked him and ridiculed him and uh, made a joke out of his whole testimony and uh, then he began to realize that what he was saying was contrary to how he was living and uh, he was really bringing shame reproach upon the name of Christ so he repented and got his life right and became a good man a man greatly used of God but in 2 Timothy 2 24 it says and the servant of the Lord must not strive otherwise you're gonna you're gonna be persuading lost people who don't believe to become believers uh, you, you can't be quarrelsome and argumentative all the time it's not an argument you can win an argument and lose a soul so it's not about getting into a quarrel it's it's a humble pleading with people to believe so he says the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle that word is kind he has to be kind unto all men you approach people as a servant apt to teach otherwise you have to be instructive you have to be gentle and instructive then patient the idea is you have to be bearing long or, or forbearing long bearing suffering under uh, not everybody's going to be persuaded right away but in your uh, act of desperation to win them to faith don't push them over the cliff <laughs> in verse 25 it says in meekness and gentle humility instructing now this is gently like you do with a child like a little child in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves the idea is like you are trying to talk someone out of killing himself he's standing on the edge of uh, the window on a 14-story building ready to jump you're going to approach him gently and cautiously and try to persuade him uh, don't push him over <laughs> so why because if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth uh, two things have to happen is the grace of God operating in their heart it's not just your art of persuasion and the truth there is the Spirit of God who is operating upon their heart and bringing them to repentance many times I've had people say I'm not a believer and I, I, I don't believe in God I said well sure you do and they'll get upset with me and I have said well you know the, the that that's the fact is that there is a light that lighteth every man that cometh in the world there's a little neon light in every one of us that says God is God is God is so they can deny that light but there is a God who operates both upon their heart and from within them in the concept of of a conscience that uh, shows them and reveals to them that there is a consciousness of God in them they have to deny it but God is working uh, that God will bring them give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth otherwise to really know that he is real and wants to communicate to them that's just blessing of uh, of hearing and keeping the Word of God in verse 26 and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil you can't believe for anyone my faith uh, whether it's strong or weak cannot benefit anyone they have to get their own it's like I've said many times uh, if you want to be warm you got to get your own fire and uh, no one can can warm you from within you have to have your own heart uh, turned on turned on by God and but when you consent to believe that is the first step it's that just to say cry out to God I believe I help thou mine unbelief so that's how you, how this all takes place God is appealing to you just to begin to believe you, you all of these things open up into your eyes and your sight the moment you say I can believe that the Bible is the Word of God and you begin there you, you can accept the Bible as the Word of God and everything else opens up the lights come on 
Now then you can understand the, 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 the doctrine of salvation because you find that in the Bible. You can understand everything that God's doing. That's all found in the Bible. But faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So you're to be gentle and, and, uh, um, and, and patient and, and meekness instructing those. Uh, why? So that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. See, that's what unbelief is. It's, a, it's being captured by Satan who wants to blame God for everything he does. And people fall into that and then they, re they reject the God of the Bible. So then there are those who seek instruction but argue against the truth. Now, that happens so often with pastors. We all, you have somebody who's been saved for six months and though you've been a preacher for 40 years, they come and they want to argue against the truth. Or they, they've got this new revelation. And, uh, but, uh, no good to argue with them. You have to let them go their pathway. So if such a person is going to be taught about moral responsibility and personal holiness as necessary to God's blessing, very often he will argue grace against law. He will argue liberty to the point of license to sin. But the point is he's opposing himself. And the good, uh, the, the good God wants to, uh, that God wants to do in his life, he, he's opposing that. So the summary of the blessings upon these three actions toward the book of Revelation I think is best summed up by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24 through 27. Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So here, here's how we're supposed to see as believers our life. We're, going to, we're supposed to run just as if we're in a race, but there's only going to be one person that receives the prize. Now the prize is, the, is to be the winner. So he's using this metaphor that this is the way every one of us ought to run the race that's before us. So run that you may obtain, otherwise this, this prize. Now there's going to be a lot of people that, win, that are going to win first place in this contest. But it's rewards, not salvation. Uh, rewards for faithful service. And so he says in verse 25, And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate. Otherwise, he exercises restraint, is contained within God's will. He, he stays within the boundaries of God's will in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That's those who run this uh, physical race. They're, they're just... They're, they're, a crown, this wreath of, uh, of that they're going to get, the wreath of, of uh, plants, and it's going to, it's corruptible. It, it won't last very long. But we, uh, an incorruptible crown. So verse 26, Paul says, I therefore so run. I'm in this race. Not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. Otherwise, I know what's going to happen. Uh, I keep, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. That's to the will of God. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So even though he's preaching he, and he's living in, in sin, if that's the case, uh, he could still be a castaway at the judgment seat. Now I'm not talking about uh, being cast away in the concept of being lost, uh, but disapproved or disqualified for the rewards from carnal fleshly ministry. This is a concept of, of standing in a pile of ashes at the judgment seat of Christ because all your works are just wood, hay, and stubble. So notice the intensity of life revealed in these few verses of Scripture and the warning that they contain. It is this intensity that must be translated into reading and hearing and keeping the things revealed by the book of Revelation in order to be blessed by those truths. There's an intensity here. So the blessings of reading, hearing, and keeping the things taught in the book of Revelation are for believers only. 
only because only believers will live within the context of the, these eminent events looming upon the horizon of our existence. They're real. You're looking at the horizon. You're seeing the sunset and the day star arising in our hearts. You're seeing it. It's right there. It's real. Therefore, the, these blessings cannot begin until a person becomes a believer and is born again and begins to live and walk in the light of his revelation. That's why the word of God in 1 John says, Walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His Son shall cleanse us from all sin. So we have to walk in the light of what we believe. If you don't walk in the light, you don't believe in the light. You're, 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 how, you know, the light that is in there be darkness, and how great is the darkness. So if you don't walk in the light, don't, don't say you believe it. If you're, if you're not, if your goal in life is not to walk in it, now then you haven't believed it. But you can't walk in it until you're born again. Because you're born again into this truth. It is faith in the, the things of God that begins in the Bible. You have no concept or understanding of salvation if you don't get it from the Bible. Because you get what God says about salvation from God. That's the only way you can understand or believe it. So it's important for you to understand the five verbs of faith that define faith. Repent, believe, confess, call, and receive. You have to repent of sin and dead works. You cannot keep believing in your own self-righteousness. You can't keep living in sin and thinking that's okay with God. It is not. Uh, you can't think that baptism will save you or church membership will save you or being good. I don't care what church you go to, your church can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. So you have to repent of sin and dead works. Then you have to uh, believe that God's wrath has been satisfied in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus bore your sins in his body on the tree and has remitted the penalty of sin, uh, which is death, upon your life. Believe and rest in that. Believe that he will give you his gift of righteousness in the indwelling person of his Holy Spirit the moment you re believe in these truths and call upon his name. Then you have to confess with your mouth. That means publicly that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Jehovah God. That's a quote from Joel chapter 2 verse 32. Conf confess that he is Jehovah, that he is the creator God. And he is the Lord sovereign of our lives. And then call upon that name, the name of Jesus, to save you. Knowing that he promises, for whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. Do that today. Do it right now. And I trust that that will be something that I can help you with. There's a couple books I want you to be able to see. They're up here on the, uh, you can see in the top of the screen. They're both available to you in PDF files, free of charge. Uh, Learning to Lead the Conversion of the Heart. Uh, we will send that to you free of charge by PDF if you send us an email at that email address. And then the Book of Revelation. That's a 257,000 word um, thesis upon uh, verse by verse explanation of the Book of Revelation. And you can have that in a PDF file as well, free of charge if you will. Simply send us an email, and we will send those to you by return. If you want other books, they are available on the, the website, disciplemakerministries.org, and you can order them online, and we'll send them to you by mail. I want to be able to help you with these things and uh, to explain them. If you've got questions that you'd like to have answered, or maybe something that you'd like to hear me teach on or preach about, Send that to me by email and uh, write out your question. I'll try to answer it the best I can in the days ahead, it, it, as short as they are. But I'm going to be trying to put, be putting more up pretty regularly every day now, if I can, as I find time. Uh, and as my wife allows me, we get pretty busy around here. But uh, we pray that this will be a blessing to you and can be an encouragement 
Make sure you share these with other people. That's a cheap way to get the Word of God out and to other people just to take this and you can send them by email either from Facebook, uh, on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Sermon Audio. You can send them all to your friends uh, simply by attaching a, a link to that and uh, you can send it by email to all over the world and it's all for you free of charge so may God bless you and we will be praying for you and that God would use you in the days ahead to advance his kingdom in Jesus name